Okay, go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. Um, we are going to have a nice lecture today by Walter Welthaus. Hi, Walter. Welcome to the to the lecture series at Morgan. Uh, I will give a little introduction about Walter, and then I will leave the stage to him. Walter Feldhaus was appointed as Chief Government Advisor on the Built and Rural Environment in December 2020. As a member of the board, he advises on spatial programs and projects on the state involving themes such as mobility and urbanization. Walter Feldhaus is an urban planner and architect and partner, partner of Must Urbanism. With offices in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and Cologne, Germany, Must works on urban transformation strategies for cities and regions, cartography, and research. Wouter is also a member of Stadtform, an independent think tank that advises forum, sorry, that advises the municipality of Amsterdam on urban development. From 2012 to 2018, Wouter was head of the master degree in urban and architect in the urban urbanism at the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture. Speaking of which, uh, Morgan students in 2020 and 2021 in the spring have been collaborating with uh, the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture on Just Cities. And that was just a very interesting experience. Walter, thank you very much for being with us. The stage is all yours. Thank you for the incredible introduction, ah. Christine. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, it's uh, I'm broadcasting here from Amsterdam, so it's um, pretty late. Um, 10 o'clock, everybody's asleep. But uh, for me, it's a late night show. For you, it's a nice uh, afternoon uh, lecture. I will share my screen and... Um, um, I was asked to tell something about just cities. Um, um, it's it's a topic that um, um, yeah that keeps me busy in the past ten years, so to say, and especially the the meetups with uh, Baltimore and my visits to Baltimore were also very inspiring, and uh, also for from a Dutch perspective, a lot to learn about how we can create better and more just cities. Um, and my lecture will be an, an European perspective on this theme um, and also a perspective for me as a designer, as an urban designer um, based in Amsterdam as an, uh, yeah, an, an office called MUST, uh, which is an office that works basically on uh, um, urban transformations. And we really like to co-create and cooperate with uh, everybody making the city together. Um, just city for us is, is a city where um, everybody has the ability to uh, give value and meaning to its own life. And that's, um, I think, one of the most difficult things as an urban designer uh, to strive for because we as a profession also are very dominant in how we define spaces and how we design spaces. So actually we are an office that um, do a lot of invisible work. I think uh, um, to start with an, an important yeah, idea of how we like to work is that actually when we finished the, the job um, there will be no visible traces um, in the best, uh, as the best results, um, just a good city life. Um, so we are not uh, the office making iconic architecture, but we are raised and working in the Netherlands. And uh, the Netherlands is, of course, very famous for uh, iconic architecture. That's also where I start my story. The capital of icons, Rotterdam. Um, Rotterdam was an, like Baltimore and uh, a struggling harbor city but uh, it found its way out uh, something like 20 years ago and that was uh, an, uh, an architecture was an important part of it 
um, they refurbished big harbor fronts, but also huge uh, inner city areas. And iconic architecture, uh, like uh, this one from uh, Ome, from Colas, is, uh, and aside, uh, the Renzo Piano block, are really the landmarks that show the revival of, an, uh, of, of the harbor city. And we can be, I think, very positive about it and also being proud about it. Uh, that's, uh, for example, Lonely Planet, due to the architectural interventions, called Rotterdam one of the most attractive cities of the world. Um, and that ends up uh, uh, with an endless exhibition almost of uh, striking architecture. Um, but there was something strange going on in the city because meanwhile, while on the outside or the inside of the city, uh, uh, there was a lot of production in uh, exposure more on the outskirts of the city, a complete our story was taking place. Um, Rotterdam is also famous for its pretty uh, bold interventions in the urban fabric and uh, remodeling complete neighborhoods. Like, and uh, the idea is that by tearing down uh, public housing and building back for more expensive housing will help the city to get a little bit more mixed and a little bit more diverse in income. And especially that, I think, uh, is one of the most difficult stories of Rotterdam. This is a picture of an area uh, teared down 10 years ago. Now it's completely built up again. But this was a uh, late 19th century, early 20th century neighborhood. I think very comparable with the old neighborhoods of um, uh, Baltimore. And if, was the, if this was a neighborhood in uh, Amsterdam, it would be preserved. Uh, in Rotterdam, it's teared down. And the strange thing is that also complete communities were wiped away. And uh, this was one of the most yeah, important pictures for me uh, 10 years ago, showing uh, communal farming on a completely demolished uh, 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 district. So the city invested in place making with a pig and communal farming, but first wiped away all the uh, people living in the area. And that made me think about what, what's going on in this city. And uh, then we found, uh, uh, then I found out it's really a kind of approach of um, a city that has a culture uh, coming from we can make society and we can make an ideal new, new world. Um, so if we intervene, we can make a, a Rotterdam into a better place. You can see it in the iconic architecture, but also in the program they implement. Like this one, 20,000 inhabited public houses are going to be teared down the coming 10 years for uh, higher incomes, uh, not empty. Uh, like uh, some areas in Baltimore are, but really inhabited. And that makes, um, it took another 10 years, past 10 years, that people became aware that this uh, was actually a pretty aggressive tactic. And it's only a year or two ago that the people in uh, the next neighborhood to be demolished started to protest. Um, before they didn't protest at all, and now they started to resist. And this became a big uh, yeah, fight for justice uh, in, in, in Rotterdam City. Um, and the strange thing is that in the same month that everybody, I think, knows this building, at least we think everybody knows, but this is a new iconic building uh, by MVRDV, um, built up in the city center, um, actually replacing a park. Um, um, it's, uh, and in the same month, this happened, uh, just a few miles away. So you see uh, on the back even also the skyscrapers of downtown. So it's really not far away that on the one hand, we have a showcase of huge architecture. On, on the other hand, we tear down beloved neighborhoods with affordable housing. And this uh, um, in a country uh, where we say, yeah, the stupid Americans, uh, they don't take care for their cities. Uh, we do it better, but it's um, maybe better planned 
but it's similar aggressive, uh, so to say. So what I learned from uh, America is that the, the story of the, the tactics of redlining taking place rather from for 80, 90 years um, is not a, a, a tactic we know from the uh, in the Netherlands. But here, actually, we have for the moment an, in Rotterdam a gigantic uh, government-driven gentrification, not covered up with hidden rules, but simply out in the open. And I think that's a big story and discussion nowadays. Is this the way we work on a diverse and uh, just city? And um, is this the way uh, to improve uh, the life in the city? And the bottom line is that we in the Netherlands love to uh, steer on statistics. So if we have an, uh, a, yeah, uh, a good mixed statistics, we have a good mixed neighborhoods. So if we have a neighborhood with a concentration of low incomes, we don't think let's help the people to get a better income, but we simply move them out. So the statistics get better. And that's, I think, an, 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 a practice that uh, faces more and more critique nowadays. And I think also for uh, you guys in America, a very interesting change and discussion about how we deal with people like immigrants from different African countries in these neighborhoods. And that brought me and some other people in the, in the Netherlands to what, what to the thinking, what, what does that mean, just city? And um, um, we did some, together with some other people, some serious uh, uh, literature studies on just cities. And we found out actually that a, a just city is not a liberal or, or a conservative perspective. Uh, it's not left or right. Actually, every society uh, exists out of a definition of what's just. Um, but you can say there are different basic perspectives. And I think that is really good to know also when you uh, approach a city or approach a neighborhood that you have to be aware that there are four really uh, different possible values when you talk about just city. And the first one is, um, um, yeah, the, that's called the prosperous city. That means that's a city where we try to achieve as much happiness as possible for as many people as possible. So this is uh, get everybody on the top. Uh, philosophy. This is, let's say, the most socialistic one uh, where you try to get as much as possible for everybody. Um, the other one um, is uh, a principle that says, no, we have to look for a more equal city. So inequality has to be limited and uh, we have to watch out for spatial sorting. Actually, this view on a just city is what's happening in Rotterdam. So we see in statistics spatial shorting, uh, sorting. So we intervene and mix it. So there's no statistical spatial sorting anymore. But the strange thing is that uh, we then don't talk about people, but we talk about numbers. Um, and the third one is uh, a one called supply city. Um, and that's a one that says, well, uh, it's hard to get uh, everything equal. Uh, let's get realistic, but let's try to get enough for everybody. And let's get a social minimum. And I think this, this is what you can call actually the, the, the liberal European approach in general, where there is a kind of uh, um, bottom line that's uh, 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 of rock bottom that nobody can hit because we with the society and the social institutions, we catch everybody. But uh, above this uh, uh, minimum, there is a lot of differentiation and uh, uh, you have rich people and poor people. Um, but there's enough for everybody. And the last one I think is the most American one. Uh, that's the one you can call the free city. And that's actually the one that says, well, you have a very liberal approach of uh, a level playing field where everybody has the same rights. But if somebody has more gifts, talents, or uh, family to uh, get 
uh, to play the rules better uh, than the other, um, then we're not going to correct it. So we don't catch anybody who falls out. Uh, it's your own uh, risk and yeah, opportunity to play the game wherever you want. Um, and I think these four different perspectives should be always in mind when you talk with polit polit politicians uh, about uh, just cities, because every uh, every political wing has another uh, just city compass, compass in that sense. And uh, when it comes up to me, uh, I'm uh, most uh, charmed by uh, uh, David Harvey's definition of uh, a just city. Uh, which is also um, uh, a Baltimorean uh, um, um, uh, inspired one because he uh, uh, yeah, lectures for a long time in Baltimore. Uh, and he says, well, the ride to the city is, uh, is far, should be far more than the individual liberty to access urban resources. But it's also really right that uh, you can change yourself by changing the city. And I, I like this one very much because it's not only about that we as designers or politicians or uh, citizens uh, uh, give services to people, but we give the people also the freedom uh, to change the city themselves. And I think this is really uh, one of the most difficult parts of being an urban designer or an architect. What can you give uh, as a designer and what can you leave open so people can add and change things uh, themselves to make them their life more interesting and more uh, comfortable. And when it then comes to yeah, what I think in my daily practice is uh, 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 the keys where I, I can work on as an urban designer, then I have actually uh, four keys that I can yeah, um, design on. <laughs> And that's uh, one about uh, uh, taking care for uh, uh, good housing, taking care for accessible jobs and education, try to create a healthy environment and uh, define and deliver a uh, generous uh, public space. And I want to il illustrate that with some um, uh, with four projects uh, I worked on in the, in the last uh, five years. And to start with the uh, affordable housing, we in, uh, uh, in Amsterdam have developed a, a concept together with a uh, housing corporation um, to make start blocks. And these are um, uh, cheap uh, temporary housing concepts uh, uh, where we try to make space for new people coming into the city. And the nice thing is that uh, we deliberately mix in these projects uh, um, uh, refugees um, and students. So uh, what I like very much about, um, as long as they are uh, young and they are single, that's the, um, um, they, these are the criteria. And the idea is that um, both groups actually have a complete different background but uh, are working on the same future. Uh, they want to start in a new city. They want to uh, uh, develop themselves and uh, get to know as, as many people as possible and find knowledge and social networks. And um, we did, an, uh, what I like very much about this series of projects is that we did three now uh, and that we were also able, because they are temporarily, to do some experiments. Uh, so the first one was a very uh, yeah, dirty one, uh, reused old containers, um, but uh, we regrouped them around public spaces and tried to uh, make communities where students and refugees were mixed uh, uh, completely on every hallway. And uh, some things went wrong, some things went worked very well, and a nice, thing is that we were able to make a more uh, uh, elaborated uh, version a few years later uh, and it was called a start block in uh, Elsa and it's not com this complete housing area but uh, uh, 
this is going to be in development for the future. And we did the first phase um, um, with these uh, start blocks again as a kind of uh, starting point for the development in the area. And what we and uh, uh, developed here is that we uh, skipped the idea of huge communal spaces in the outdoor, uh, but try to make more uh, internal public uh, communal spaces, uh, huge balconies and uh, uh, living rooms in the, in, the, in the buildings. And again, these, this project is also temporary. It's for 10, 10 years, but this is completely new, uh, um, yeah, fast industrial build. Uh, it's actually also one of the most sustainable and energy friendly projects uh, uh, built in the Netherlands. Um, and here you have small housing units for, with a very low price and also with very low energy costs um, and uh, a an, an huge uh, promotion of uh, uh, communal uh, living together. And that's what we actually did with a very simple and cheap way is that we had to make a fire escape. And the only thing actually we did was uh, yeah, oversize the fire escape. So the fire escape became also a huge communal balcony and communal staircase. And um, this worked out pretty well. So um, the balconies started to become uh, uh, yeah, not really COVID proof uh, outdoor spaces. Um, and uh, you have to imagine that we also here in, uh, discovered that, or in the first project we discovered that uh, a group shouldn't be bigger than something like 15 households um, to get personal contacts and to uh, yeah, keep uh, everybody uh, connected in the, uh, in the community. So we completely developed this block on units, uh, of floors with 15 units, uh, and they all combined into little urban villas, uh, so to say. And what we're doing now, and that's, I think, something we should always do as uh, designers, but we never do, actually, is also try to uh, understand if it's working. So we're now doing, actually, in, uh, in, uh, in research. Uh, it's now open for three years, this block, to find out if these uh, wished connections between um, uh, refugees and students all, all, um, yeah, really develop. And here you can see a kind of yeah, picture story uh, about how different groups are getting connected and get to know each other. And I think one of the most valuable things uh, um, uh, for the people living here is that uh, the students uh, get to know uh, people that have really troubled and serious life before. So there are a lot of traumatized uh, uh, refugees that uh, came from war zones, um, from Syria, for example, or Eritrea. So it's not only an intercultural um, uh, uh, connection, but it's also a connection between kids that are pretty young coming from safe uh, uh, Dutch uh, uh, families. And on the other hand, uh, kids that come from really yeah, uh, difficult worlds. And uh, these two get develop an, 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 a language and, uh, and groups together, which I think are very, very valuable for the rest of their lives. And in that sense, also an, an impulse for, an, 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 in my opinion, a just and hopefully also better society. Um, the second layer, is um, the layer of um, um, uh, getting accessible jobs and education. And um, I was in the starting in the start of my story pretty pretty critical about the the demolition um, um, strategy of Rotterdam. But in the same program, they also have a very uh, um, yeah um, uh, thorough. Um, jobs and education program running. And especially there, I think they achieve a lot of uh, interesting goals. Um, if you look at um, yeah, how, how a part of Rotterdam um, scores, then you see that it, it's the little diamond in the middle, the blue one. Um, 
and, and the, the green one is Rotterdam, <clears throat> then you see that are parts of Rotterdam that really have a lot of trouble, uh, and especially income and uh, work and uh, education are hard to find in these areas. So <clears throat> what we are doing is um, uh, investigating how we can connect um, parts of the city in a better way with, uh, for example, a new bridge over there or better and more lively uh, city streets, but also by bringing in um, city life uh, into, into these areas. And especially this process, I think, is already executed, is very interesting, is that they, they really wanted to make good schools in the area. Uh, so kids that uh, have uh, uh, talents um, don't have to leave the area. Uh, to find a good school. And in the other way around, also kids from better neighborhoods were, are attracted to come to these schools because they are also on city level, high end. And I think here you can see that you really can steer on the indicators of uh, a just city, uh, like education, to get it into the neighborhoods and really use it as a kind of starting point of an, uh, yeah, an, uh, social development of the community. Um, uh, now I'm involved also in thinking about the new bridge, which is planned to to come here or a new connection over here. And here in the north, you have the university and a lot of uh, business districts. And in this, uh, it takes you something like uh, 40, hour, 40 minutes by public transport. But if you can cycle over the bridge, it's just 15 minutes. So there's a, um, also with an intervention in the infrastructure, uh, especially of if public uh, uh, um, uh, like a metro or with um, individual mobility like an, uh, a bike, um, we can really achieve also uh, an, uh, prox uh, proximity, proximity for uh, uh, jobs uh, for this area. Um, the third level is uh, the level of a healthy environment. And I think that's one of the most yeah, at least the one in the Netherlands, we are really uh, have a lot of discussion about this. And um, I think this is one of the most challenging because we have to rethink our complete way of organizing the cities and organizing and dealing with services and materials uh, in, in, in the city. And for example, Amsterdam uh, has decided that it's um, uh, it will be an emission-free city in 2030. And uh, that's that's within eight years now, nine years. So uh, we are in a hurry. And one of the uh, most uh, difficult things is how you get the logistics uh, um, uh, emission-free. And what Amsterdam is working on now is a kind of strategy of... Um, yeah, um, distribution hubs around the city where the big trucks come in and then the uh, the goods are um, reloaded in small uh, e EVs or e-bikes uh, uh, transported to the city. And here you see a an, uh, an, an kind of mix with the the, the, the entrance of the e-commerce. So that, that, that that's, uh, yeah, you have um, business to consumer networks uh, developing pretty fast. So also for the e-commerce, we need new distribution hubs, um, but also for the old uh, economy, we need it. So we are really looking now in the city uh, how we can uh, arrange it in the best way. And uh, one of the areas uh, we worked on as an office is, the, uh, is a new you know, logistic hub in the west part of uh, the city which is actually situated in a pretty uh, a beautiful landscape. And here I think you see one of the most difficult decisions that uh, uh, if we want to make the city more livable uh, and emission free, we have to build new warehouses somewhere. And this was one of the plots that was assigned for it. Um, and we tried to do it in such a way that it's not only in a huge logistic center, but becomes also a, a, a valuable place for the city. And uh, that's something we try to achieve with a lot of sustainability goals, like 
catching all uh, the rainwater uh, developing in the freshwater system, um, use water as an, uh, a feature uh, that also brings quality into, into the area. Um, and we're now yeah, uh, designing in, 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 in almost in execution of a kind of new neighborhood park uh, for uh, where actually all the water of the roofs is collected and becomes not only a business park for the um, uh, for the companies in the area, but also gets a, a public accessible route and recreational route uh, through uh, the, the outskirts of the city. So it also becomes a part uh, of the yeah for the, the people living in the in the, uh, the adjacent neighborhoods. And another thing uh, we're trying to do here is also that we don't touch uh, the clay. Uh, this is a polder, um, and that means that normally you put in another meter of sand on it, and then it's dry. Here we don't uh, put sand in. We reuse all the existing organic products in the area and try uh, to make an uh, actually a complete reversible uh, um, uh, urban landscape out of it and that means that we are also able to catch all the ecological uh, values from uh, uh, plants and birds and animals in the area and also get specific vegetation that fits to this area and it's it's homegrown in this area so you, in the end we get a kind of network where um, get almost a showcase of uh, um, uh, the existing landscape but then in a very dense um, um, uh, version because of course you have these huge logistic boxes uh, in between well and the last one is um, uh, the generous public space uh, and i think that's the one uh, that i like the most uh, um, also, the, I like the most to work on, and um, this is again um, the start block um, I showed as an example for the public housing. Um, and here we designed a huge field, and the idea was that uh, the people living in the area uh, develop a community uh, in this uh, in this space and start to do urban gardening or uh, start to have uh, outdoor sports or whatever and actually they used it as a storage for uh, uh, waste products because they found out there was a nicer space just around the corner where they can could build with uh, uh, circular materials their own um, uh, little meeting room and bar so here actually we completely failed in uh, designing uh, a public space although it was very generous but it was too big and too anonymous and um, excuse me uh, and there was also no connection with a group that really wanted to use it and in another project we worked on an old train uh, repair uh, sites in the, uh, in the Netherlands um, we developed together with the people from the, uh, the neighborhood around and the kids a playground. And uh, I, what I really like about this playground is that we didn't design it. We only uh, defined the conditions for the playground. It was a very polluted area. Um, and actually we helped the uh, thinking and about collecting the materials, <coughs> but it's really put together and completely uh, built up by uh, the neighborhood themselves. And you really see that uh, um, this space is completely adapted uh, by the community. Uh, and actually the designer here is, the design part here is that we defined the space where it could happen. And uh, actually we did some coaching and that's it. And that's, I think, one of the most interesting balances. What do you design and what do you leave open? And for example, this is an inner site in the city of Amsterdam, uh, where uh, you have a very formal big square in the back uh, with also the, the old Olympic Stadium. So that's really a kind of yeah, high-end city square. 
but we were able uh, to also to make a kind of hidden gem with a little play playground that's completely uh, maintained and also uh, yeah, used by the people uh, living around the area. So even uh, in a space where you're living in the middle of the city, it can be possible to make a kind of communal spaces where people can uh, uh, arrange things uh, themselves. And here there was budget from the city, but again, it was really also uh, designed together in cooperation with uh, 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 the people in the area. And in that sense, uh, we worked on a lot of these kinds of spaces. You know, on, on the right of the picture, you see also a little playground on a spot where there was first uh, mainly a car park. And uh, then uh, we, we love to design areas actually where there are no cars, um, because I think if you talk about the generous public space, you should get uh, rid of the aggressor. And the, uh, the most aggressive part is the, the car and its driver. So get these factors out uh, and then you get city life uh, in. And um, uh, that means to me that I always, try to get as much uh, yeah, uh, pedestrian area as possible. So here you see a, 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 a very wide over, over dimensions uh, um, uh, sidewalk, but it's not a sidewalk. It's a place uh, where the people, uh, that the people can occupy and can use. And here I want to stress one thing. Um, uh, which is also very important. That's, I think, how the building is related then to this generous public space. And especially here, you see that the architect also made a uh, generous uh, uh, space in the, in the facade. And I think that's for architects one of the biggest challenges of these days, that we should understand that a facade is not only the boundary between inside and outside, but the facade can be a space in itself as well, like the medieval castle with the huge min windows or the uh, the temple. Uh, you have uh, uh, a space that you can call the facade and you can design as a space. And here you see that by designing a space with a setback window, you certainly can, you get a kind of table in the public space. And then if you then look, for example, in, uh, in, in Baltimore, you see all, all the traditional stoops. I think these are really elements we should celebrate and activate in, uh, in, instead of uh, uh, trying to get rid of them. Because this is, these are the places where the communities can start and where neighbors um, start to meet and uh, get to know each other. Okay. These are the four, and I want, uh, I want to stress one thing uh, uh, as, an, as a final call to America, and that's uh, the street. Because I think uh, with, the, with the four design tools we have, uh, they all come together uh, in, in, uh, in the main street. And uh, uh, I think that main streets are and should be really the solid binders of the just city. The streets are the places where all the people, all, all sorts of people, all groups can come together. Um, and there's a kind of saying that's uh, it's very clear that says, show me your street and I will tell what kind of society you are. And that's really true. You can really tell uh, from the street what kind of society you are, you are. Are you scared? Are you open? Are you happy? Um, that's all you can see in the street. And I wanted to show you a few examples how important streets can be. And also what we uh, actually, what disaster came over the streets in the past 60 years. And this is an, uh, a, a very uh, in, uh, yeah, interesting uh, American invention in, in Germany. Uh, it, it's the bombing of uh, Hamburg. Uh, and Hamburg was one of the yeah the big harbors of uh, the Second World War, where all the military uh, ships uh, were uh, situated. So it was heavily bombed, bombed by the Allies, and the city looked like this. But there were, it was still okay, the city, in the sense that there was a lot bombed, 
but there was still a lot of urban fabric left over. So after cleaning up the bombing, the city looked like it. And this is the moment where uh, our profession came in and said, we have to make a modern city out of it. So you see here the projection of uh, uh, the car world uh, coming in. And uh, same to America, uh, everywhere in the world, uh, of course, in the 50s and 60s, we really destroyed the cities uh, by making it accessible for cars. And here you see that the city uh, was bombed, but still, yeah, there, but the real demo demolition actually started with the car. And uh, after uh, 10 years, uh, the project was done. The city was completely dead and completely infected by cars. As a little virus, you see them all, or bacteria, you see them all. Uh, clitting to the uh, 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 to the curbs, and that ends up in a city like this. That uh, uh, you cannot uh, cross uh, uh, the streets anymore. You have to make bridges, uh, and this is really uh, th like Hamburg is now struggling with this. And you see that they now uh, try to make space for bikes, but again you see that uh, there's no space for bikes, so they try to fit it in. And you see uh, how difficult it is to get these cars out. Uh, although a lot of politicians want it in uh, in in, uh, in in Hamburg, but they fail. And that's that that that's because we we are not um, completely aware yet that we should see streets uh, not anymore as a trans transit space, but really should see the streets as a social and economic space and a very important factor for this uh, just city. And of course, there are people saying it all for a long time. Um, Jan Gale, a Danish uh, uh, designer is one of them, and he has a very clear statement. Hey, if you design for cars, you get cars. If you design for people, you get people. And this is uh, looks simple and uh, maybe too simple, but it actually is this simple. Um, and for example, in uh, in London, they are now discovering how important these streets are. And there was a program in in London for the past twenty years where they really want to celebrate and uh, 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 the high streets because they discovered that they were so important for a just economy. Uh, and they found out that uh, actually. Uh, the economy of the high streets really infects the whole city and uh, brings also jobs close to people. Um, they have 600 high streets, and I think this is one of the most striking ones. That's 50% um, of the jobs actually outside downtown are along the high streets, and very important, um, 60 of, almost 70% of the residents live just five minute walk from the high street. So if you talk about a city with of proximity or a five minute walk city or 10 minute walk city, actually it's there, but we don't use it yet. But uh, on the other hand, 50% of the residents even don't leave their neighborhood every day. So you see that actually uh, uh, the, uh, the, the daily routines are in the neighborhoods, the, uh, we have the potential of bringing the work and the uh, amenities close to the people, but we uh, are still looking at streets only as a traffic space. So what they're doing in London is really trying to help uh, little businesses uh, with investing uh, in, the, in the area, uh, help and promote uh, uh, attractive and pedestrian spaces and get the car step by step out of these high streets or not completely out, but reduce the space. So what I like very much about the London strategy is they do also a lot of neighborhood close reading. So it's not a big plan. It's a plan of a little, uh, uh, yeah, thousands of small projects. And that means that you have to understand as a designer uh, also how the blocks work, how the, the surface roads work. And so it's not a story about big uh, concepts, but it's a story about catch and steer. Look where there is, look what's happening and try to reframe and 
reuse it uh, in the in the development. And uh, actually, in London, you have very very good examples, like uh, in East London, which is a really tough area where they yeah really were able to get the uh, the the business really out uh, out. Uh, to get the doors open and uh, get the business out on the street again, so it becomes more visible. And I think this is a very valuable small strategy that can work in every street and also can be very uh, valuable, I think, for uh, the strategy in American cities. Um, make make the streets wider, less cars, uh, and make spaces and uh, special amenities that attract people. Sometimes very cheap, like this one, a temporary social hub, but uh, very effective. So the the, the London catch and steer uh, strategy, I think, is one of the most interesting strategies uh, uh, we can learn from, and uh, should try to apply as much as possible. And um, Mark Brearley, a uh, London-based uh, designer. Uh, uh, came up with this high street story and the catch and steer strategy. And what I like very much about uh, Mark Brearley is that he says, well, I have a plan, but nothing turns out as uh, we expected. So also be modest as a designer and be happy that uh, the results are better than you ever thought. And then my last one I want to show is a uh, um, story about uh, also the high streets of Berlin which is also a nice story because it has a time warp. Um, the western part of Berlin was completely uh, remodeled, remodeled in the, in the, uh, in the market uh, liberal economy. So um, um, everything was teared down, big car structures and, and so on. On the, uh, uh, the Russian part or the Eastern Germany part, there were a lot of things just left over, lack of money. Um, um, so uh, very poor areas where actually when the wall came down, everything was still there like a uh, uh, hundred years ago, like for example, the pavement. So uh, they re didn't redo the pavement in a hundred years. And that's, uh, so this is a, a picture uh, um, in, the, in the 80s, in the, uh, when it still was Eastern Germany. And this is the picture uh out nowadays so you see that uh, actually the, uh, the 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 public space is uh, uh was very generous and had a kind of interesting uh simple zoning where uh, it was pretty clear what's uh, uh what, what can, can be claimed uh by uh, somebody who is living or working in the buildings and what parts should be uh public uh, uh, and uh, always accessible. And these simple principles of how the pavement is organized uh, led to an incredible richness of uh, 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 yeah, social initiatives in the public space. Uh, so in my opinion, this proves also that uh, we as designer uh, can do a very can achieve very big results by very little interventions. And here the intervention is actually that you have cobblestones and flat tiles, um, and uh, that's it. Um, the only thing that it's really important is that the uh, it's a wide space. So you have enough space to get all the claims in. And that means, I think, that we really should dare to give the space to the residents and the entrepreneurs to shape their own street. I think Berlin, Berlin proves that uh, uh, it works out. And also uh, the COVID pandemic, where we got, well, I think, also in Baltimore, some, some street initiatives reclaiming the streets. I think that's really um, a strategy that we really should encourage and celebrate uh, as a designer. And that comes then, then to, I think, uh, uh, we as designers uh, are yeah, qualified to be creative, but uh, I'm always surprised about how creative 
every ordinary guy or girl uh, can be. So if you chop a tree, people invent a bench. It's that simple. Um, so um, my motto after uh, the studying these uh, high streets and designing generous public spaces is that we really have to learn to make space, but also to learn that we really have to leave space. And that's easy uh, to make, but sometimes very hard uh, to imagine. So uh, if we want to give the space, we should reduce traffic and try to celebrate the diversity of the city. And it's very simple. And it proves always uh, to be right. But it's so hard to imagine for the people who make decisions. And even for us, sometimes it's very hard to imagine. So I want to encourage you to be uh, bold and simple and uh, try to think like, an, uh, like a normal everyday guy or girl and uh, just be surprised by the creativity or everybody can bring in to uh, yeah, really discover the space we live in in the cities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vatra. That was fab fabulous. Um, lots of words of wisdom there. Um, any questions from the audience? Hi, this is Christina. Hi. Actually, I do have a few questions, if I may. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Walter, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, and maybe I asked this to you before, or maybe not, or maybe because my students are asking me a lot. Um, in, we talk about a lot about communal spaces, spaces for everybody, right? The right to the city. But um, as designers, right? Um, how can in spaces that people take care of, but as designers, specifically as designers, how do we design places that instigate the appropriation, the feeling of belonging, the identification? What are those uh, architectural gestures or urban design gestures that make a space wanting to be appropriated and therefore also be taken care of? Yeah, well, uh, um, uh, again, I think the, the Berlin uh, example is a, a good one uh, because the, the, the material is very valuable and rich. So it's not a cheap pavement. It's just very old, like churches are old. Or uh, So um, the interesting thing is that we as designers are always uh, running up for the newest and the latest. Uh, but uh, the most sustainable and more also the most yeah, uh, and, uh, inviting things is that you really use the existing valuable materials you have. And I think uh, like the, uh, uh, um, if you talk about re reusing buildings, it's always about celebrating actually the original details and original materials uh, and make them appropriate for contemporary use. Uh, and then you get spaces that uh, people like to attach to, uh, spaces that people like to cherish. And that's, I think, also the difficulty with uh, the, these uh, start blocks I showed. These are, they don't have material that attracts. Um, and then it becomes, yeah, then it, uh, then it really becomes, uh, uh, comes on the account of the people themselves that they, they do it and they need maybe a little bit more coaching. Um, and you see that in the Berlin spaces, uh, uh, they are so valuable on their own that people re rediscover them. So I, I would always say, let's try to use as, yeah, as yeah, solid and um, valuable materials that last for for more than a decade um, and yeah what, what, I, what surprised me in Baltimore is there is so much material uh, over there so uh, what I mentioned about the stoops or uh, the old uh, Baltimorean houses uh, and we all tear or, or, or they are all tear down and uh, but if you if you 
keep them and celebrate them, you have cheap spaces that people start to love. Um, so yeah, that that that's and uh, maybe the the what we can bring as designer is that you can show people uh, that the things they have already are worth keeping and uh, start to investing in. Yeah, it's uh, it's very clear. Um, uh, and in, you know, if I, if I think about Italy and historical preservation, I think about the pride, right? The pride of having something yeah. old and taking care of it, yeah. I do have a second question because I, I, I want to rush before everybody else is jump into it. Uh, Wouter, um, spaces that are truly inclusive, meaning spaces that are 100% universal, spaces that, for instance, do not celebrate a culture, do not celebrate a gender, do not ce celebrate uh, an ability, right? But places that are truly inclusive. Uh, we do know that there are spaces that are gender related, many mm, spaces that are too masculine or spaces that are too white. Let's think about, I don't know, the National Mall in uh, Washington DC, right? So how do we design spaces that are truly inclusive where people of any culture, any gender, any age feel comfortable? Well, that's an, uh, the question is if, 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 yeah, I think you should start. This is a very difficult question <laughs> because you can up in a can end up in a kind of super studio non space, eh? uh, which is very beautiful in a drawing. Uh, but uh, if you have complete emptiness uh, where you can do everything for everybody, uh, uh, then it's not a space that uh, attracts or uh, that it becomes emptiness. So uh, that's, I think, the biggest risk of gearing towards total in inclusive spaces is that you get uh, generic emptiness. Uh, of, um, so in, in, the, in the social uh, um, uh, geography, uh, there's also, an, 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 uh, they say that, 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 it's, that you should always try to find a an, an, an very difficult balance between a space that has uh, f uh, is a home for a specific group, which gives it an identity and a an character, and on the other hand, is open for everybody else. Um, and I think um, uh, that's really the, the, the trick you should do. Because if you say, um, um, uh, I, I make a space a space that's only geared uh, uh, um, towards uh, people living in the neighborhood, then you yeah, then you're really uh, ending up in an almost gated community. But uh, you can also design a space where the people living in the neighborhood feel attached to, show themselves, uh, give it character, but on the other hand, have enough openness and connectivity with the rest of the world that other other uh, groups can come in and feel at home as well and um, then it comes also not about designing only the space but also programming it so uh, that's what I liked about the story about the schools in Rotterdam by uh, placing an, an, a good high school in, uh, in, an, in, an, in a difficult neighborhood brings also other kids than the kids from the neighborhood into this neighborhood. And uh, then, of course, the atmosphere of the neighborhood is very much determined by the uh, people living in the area. But I think uh, it's open and welcome with the school uh, for everybody else. So I'm not, um, well, we had some discussions about this before. I, I remember the, uh, the baskets basketball court as an, uh, a difficult thing. <laughs> it's very masculine uh, space. And I think um, the problem with these kind of uses in these spaces is that they are a single use. So you can design also a space where you can play basketball, but can also sit and hang around and talk with each other or uh, cycle around or uh, have a good chat uh, with your friends. Um, so we should, in that sense, try to get rid of single use spaces and try to get them more multi-use. But again, I'm not afraid for a group that's 
gives its its specific flavor. Otherwise, the whole city becomes equal and uh, loses character. Is that yeah. a dangerous answer? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any other questions from the students? I mean, I, I just, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that it's, it's over-programming that um, gets dangerous. And some of the most successful spaces are ones where it's just like a wide open meadow when anyone can come and feel comfortable or a grove of trees, but you can make it your own um, kind of experience. Yeah. Yeah. And should, you should always be feel welcome when you enter somewhere. And so right. what, what, what makes you feel welcome and you can be, can, yeah. Every specific group can have his own atmosphere, but how can you keep it welcome for everybody? Yeah, when I teach the history of landscape architecture, and one of my favorite students in his midterm exam said that he, you know, had been pleasantly surprised by the history class. And um, one of the things he really came across or came out of it was um, this idea that we as designers are kind of equated us to um, people throwing a party. And, you know, we want people to come to our landscapes or our architecture and feel comfortable like a guest. And I just thought that was such a, such a simple comparison, but it just kind of gets to the heart of it. You know, you want, like you said, you want your yeah. audience or your users to be comfortable and feel at home. And that's, it's, it seems seemingly simple, but it's um, very complex. So. Ryan's saying hi, right. saying it's always wonderful to hear oh. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't notice. Yeah. Well, great. If there's Thanks. no other questions, um, this was wonderful. I'll just say across the board, um, it's, it's wonderful to have a, a repeat um, lecture. Dr. spoke um, in the fall of 2019, so it's great to see you again. Um, and this was, you were our um, culmination of our fall lecture series. So we had a really successful seven lectures um, and great way to end um, the semester. So thank you for, for taking the time and for your um, inspiration and expertise. It was very nice. Uh, uh, Maybe we'll have you a third your guest. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> never know. <laughs> All right. Well, excellent. Okay. And, um, we can send you the link if you'd like for the YouTube. Yep. Have a nice day. All right. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. See you soon. Bye, Walter.